Hi everyone. Today we are going to see about a very 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 interesting class. How energy is produced from the foodstuffs. See, um, we are in a car. Eh? What happens inside a car? The petrol or diesel will be there. When oxygen is combined with this petrol or diesel, it will expand to give energy. So here in the body how we get energy from the foodstuffs what are the foodstuffs carbohydrates proteins and fats mostly they contain c a carbon hydrogen and the oxygen and usually we don't obtain energy by burning the carbon okay we cannot burn carbon we are inside our body we are burning hydrogen so how do you burn hydrogen hydrogen plus oxygen gives water so this is a highly energy producing process so we call it as biological oxidation now, so in this class we uh, deal about how we produced uh, produce energy from the foodstuffs inside our body so here you can see uh, uh, this uh, by oxidation is the removal of hydrogen from the foodstuffs uh, how these foodstuffs what are the foodstuffs carbohydrates starch and proteins and uh, fats fats like uh, triglycerides they are digested to become glucose amino acid and fatty acid so this is called primary metabolism digestion and absorption of all these uh, foodstuffs is called primary metabolism next is the secondary or the intermediary metabolism what is this intermediary metabolism breaking these foodstuffs for example in glycolysis glucose is a six carbon it becomes two three carbon pyruvate and this pyruvate becomes acetyl coa in acetyl coa it enters into tca cycle where all the hydrogen from the acetyl coa will be removed even in glycolysis uh, hydrogen is removed and in the uh, tca cycle also this hydrogen is removed so this is the called oxidation this is a removal of hydrogen um, this happens in secondary metabolism or also called intermediary metabolism and third one is the tertiary metabolism what is this tertiary metabolism what happens to that hydrogen see this hydrogen must be oxidized hydrogen will be made combined to oxygen inside the mitochondria to form water in this process energy will be produced so that is called cellular respiration or internal respiration or called tertiary metabolism so what is this free energy free energy means the energy which is available to do activity is called free energy it is given by one scientist called gibbs so we call it as gibbs change in free energy that is called delta g that is the portion of energy available to do work there are two laws of thermodynamics you know first law of thermodynamics states that energy can be neither produced <laughs> nor destroyed it can be transferred from one state to another state but here the uh, the original definition is the energy of a medium is always a constant the energy of the system remains a constant what is the second law of thermodynamics for a reaction to occur see will you read by your own no somebody have to stimulate your mother has to scold you please read like that then only you will start reading similarly the second law states that the entropy of the system must increase what is this entropy randomness okay so when the randomness increases the velocity of the reaction will increase this is called second law of thermodynamics so what is this delta g delta g may be either positive or negative if it is negative then that means what happens uh, the reaction proceeds by liberating energy so delta g negative means the reaction proceeds by liberating energy this uh, we can call it as exergonic reaction or a uh, exo exothermic reaction heat liberating reaction energy liberating reaction when delta g is positive uh, the reaction occurs by utilizing the energy uh, so when the, the delta g is positive it's called endergonic reaction or uh, 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 that is energy utilizing reaction or endothermic reaction so here uh, you take an example how does the car gets its energy we have this petrol right so when petrol is burnt what happened it expands huh? that expanded energy is transferred to the gears so that the gear starts rotating so it becomes kinetic energy and it occurs so the gear rotating is an entropic reaction 
petrol expanding itself is a exergonic reaction since uh, in a car uh, it is mechanically designed uh, the energy can be easily transferred from here to here but in our body uh, it is little bit difficult so we will see how this endergonic and exergonic reaction occurs so this what is the endergonic reaction uh, endergonic reaction or the reaction uh, uh, I mean exergonic reactions or metabolic catabolism of the foodstuffs and glycolysis, TCA cycle, fatty acid um, oxidation, uh, all these things are called exergonic reaction. What is endergonic reaction? Production of glycogen, production of fatty acid, production of cholesterol, any anabolic reaction is called an endergonic reaction. So they are not achieved simultaneously. See the burning of petrol and running of the car happens uh, at the same time. But what are we doing here? We are eating breakfast, lunch and dinner. But in between we are doing lot of activities. See we are not like cows or monkeys. We don't eat 24 7, uh, um, uh, 24 /7 hours. We don't eat. Okay? We eat only 3 intervals. So what, what, what should happen in between? How this exergonic reaction can occur? They cannot be coupled inside our body. We will, what is the solution? You can see in this uh, fire burning, it's an exergonic reaction and uh, uh, fire utilized to cook some food is called an endergonic reaction. So you can see some gears here, okay? So in this gear, you can see uh, this is delta G will be negative. That means it uh, looks like a exergonic reaction, okay? And this is an endergonic reaction. Uh, see, it goes against the gravity. So these are the anabolic reactions. Now, can we couple like this? Is it possible to couple like this? The energy utilized from exergonic reaction can be simultaneously used for endergonic reaction? No. That means we have to eat 24 7. We have to keep on eating. You have seen some athletes, okay? And they will be having some helmet along with this juice. They will be drinking and drinking. No, we don't work like that. So, for this, uh, to get energy from exergonic reaction, to save that energy and to utilize that energy for endergonic reaction, we need we need a currency. So, what is the currency called? The currency is called ATP. Okay. So, this coupling is not possible. So, energy liberated by from exergonic reaction, uh, they are used to produce ATP. This energy, this ATP will be used to produce, uh, uh, used to do the anabolic reaction like muscle activity. So, what are these uh, energy currencies? The energy currencies are usually phosphates. Why phosphate? See, the phosphoric acid linkage, uh, it's a very high energy. It can be easily breakable, by, but it uh, liberates energy. Uh, so, what are the common phosphates you can see? There is phosphoenol pyruvate, carbamyl phosphate, 1,3-BPG, creatine phosphate, ATP, ADP, uh, glucose 1-phosphate, fructose 6-phosphate, all these things. So, which phosphate do you think is ideal for a currency? Uh, <laughs> you know what is the answer? It is ATP. Why ATP? Because see, it is in the middle. So, ATP can be easily made and can be easily used. See, carbamyl phosphate may be easily used, but it is difficult to make. Uh, so, ATP is being in the middle high energy phosphate. It can be easily made and it can be easily utilized. So, ATP is the preferred source of energy for our body. Uh, you can see in this uh, figure, it has a two high energy bond. Um, adenosine, you can see triphosphate. Three phosphoric acid molecules are there. Uh, out of this, if you break one, it becomes ADP. If you break two phosphate bonds, it becomes uh, AMP. So, what are the sources of ATP? We know that the main source of uh, ATP is the substrate level phosphorylation, glycolysis and TCA cycle. You have seen the succinate, thiokinase enzyme. Uh, all these enzymes they produce ATP in the uh, during the process itself. But that is only a minor source. The most important source is called this oxidative phosphorylation. Why do we call it as oxidative phosphorylation? Simple. See, we use oxygen for breathing. This oxygen combines with hydrogen 
inside our mitochondria to become water. So it's called oxidative. What is phosphorylation? Phosphorylation is ADP plus phosphate becomes ATP. Production of phosphate that is called oxidative phosphorylation. So oxidative phosphorylation. So the process is from glycolysis, DCA cycle, fatty acid, catabolism, all these things. Hydrogen atoms are trapped by NADH and the FAD. NAD and FAD becomes NADH2 and FADH2. They are called reducing equivalence. So hydrogen is trapped. Uh, they will enter into mitochondria. This hydrogen will jump from a negative redox potential to the more positive redox potential, thereby liberating energy as ATP. So this is called oxidative phosphorylation. So we will discuss about this biological oxidation. See how this uh, uh, energy can be expressed. This is the free energy, the delta G can be expressed in terms of redox potential. Uh, see there is a, not a uh, exact reduction or a complete oxidation without the other substrate becoming uh, reduced or oxidized. So all detection or oxidation reaction can be said as redox potential and the energy giving uh, enzymes they are mostly redox reaction so we have to express the delta g as redox potential so for example what is delta g minus delta g if a reaction is exergonic then it is termed as negative delta G. If the reaction is endergonic, if it needs energy, it is positive delta G. So, uh, what happens uh, when electrons jump from a high uh, negatively, negative redox potential to more positive redox potential, that is, uh, here it is exergonic, uh, uh, that is uh, more exergonic and less exergonic like that. So, what happens when the electrons jump from the uh, negative redox potential to positive redox potential energy will be liberated so uh, what happens here in the electron transport chain uh, so electrons will be jumping from hydrogen uh, so hydrogen is trapped from our glucose and other uh, molecules using glycolysis and TCA cycle so this hydrogen uh, goes to NAD, NADH and uh, in this NAD, NADH donates this hydrogen to cytochrome complexes from the ubiquinone complex, complex 3, complex 4. Finally, this hydrogen and this electrons will be donated to oxygen to create water. So, these electrons will uh, move from more electronegative to more electropositive redox potential enzyme so that energy will be liberated. There are few uh, uh, oxidoreductases or that, that uh, redox enzymes in our body. There are so many but we are more concerned with this cytochrome oxidase because um, that is the one we are going to discuss in this class. You can see some oxidases, cytochrome oxidase is the real amino acid oxidase. Dehydrogenase, the common dehydrogenases which is occurring in the TCA cycle, uh, this uh, uh, glycolysis, um, glycogenolysis or the hydroperoxidase. This is special class. Uh, they, uh, they are sequesters of the uh, hydrogen peroxide free radicals peroxidase and catalase oxygenase and this is cytochrome p450 uh, that is used for your uh, drug catabolism and some dioxygen tryptophan pyrolase uh, or the homogeneous oxidase so these are all theoretical benefit mainly we have to know about cytochromes so what is this electron transport chain and uh, this is the final common pathway of production of energy so what is this primary metabolism Primary metabolism is digestion and absorption of the foodstuffs, breaking down uh, into micromolecules, and that is called uh, primary metabolism. So, what is this secondary metabolism? Secondary metabolism is this uh, fatty acid, glycerol, glucose, and amino acids. From here, hydrogen is removed. Uh, hydrogen is removed. This is called secondary metabolism. So what is the also called intermediary metabolism? What is the tertiary metabolism? These two hydrogen atoms, it enters in ETC, combines with oxygen to form water. In this being process, it liberates the energy. This is called tertiary 
metabolism so here we are going to discuss about this tertiary metabolism uh, in this mean process how energy is liberated uh, energy this energy is used to combine adp and phosphate so that atp will be formed so tca cycle what happens hydrogen is removed uh, from the macromolecule so glucose fatty acid amino acids they become acetyl-CoA from acetyl-CoA all the hydrogen atoms are removed do you remember oxaloacetate is the starting point of the TCA cycle and the ending point is also oxaloacetate okay so it uh, remains as a like a catalyst but what is enters acetyl-CoA enters and finally what is given nothing is there so acetyl CoA is completely broken down into carbon dioxide and the uh, hydrogen these hydrogen are trapped by NAD and FAD usually all NAD this isocitrate dehydrogenase alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase malate dehydrogen all these things and uh, NAD is uh, utilized to NAD becomes NADH2 by except this um, uh, succinate dehydrogenase we use uh, FAD hmm? so this NADH2 and FADH2 uh, it is in the mitochondria now so this NADH2 and FADH2 donates 2H what is 2H what, what is hydrogen contains hydrogen H is equal to H plus plus one electron see any atom contains electrons okay so hydrogen what does it contain it contains one proton plus one electron hydrogen contains one proton and one electron h h is equal to h plus plus electron minus and so h plus we normally refer it as proton so in this class you should not get confused uh, what is proton what is electron proton is h plus electron is e minus so when you combine a proton and one proton plus one electron gives one hydrogen atom okay it's not h2 it's a h uh, h is equal to h plus plus electron minus so this uh, reducing equivalence we call a hydrogen as a reducing equivalence they travel from the uh, electron transport chain they travel the various enzymes in the electron complexes in the electron transport chain these complexes are arranged in more electronegative to more electro positive redox potentials so while they jump uh, from a uh, more negative to uh, more positive redox potential energy is liberated that energy is used to make ATP this is electron transport chain so what are the components you well know that electron transport chain has four components uh, uh, see the mitochondria it contains the outer membrane outer membrane inner mitochondrial membrane in between inter mitochondrial space and inside the inner mitochondrial membrane it is a matrix so the inner mitochondrial membrane how it looks like it has so many cristae why the cristae is there because to increase the surface area of the uh, inner mitochondrial membrane so what happens all the electron transport chain uh, enzymes are present there the complexes are present there this complex one three and four they function as proton pumps they are not only enzymes okay uh, you have to remember this the complex one it is not only an enzyme it is also a transporter okay it transport hydrogen so hydrogen transporter So except coenzyme Q, all are proteins. Hmm. Okay, what are the complex? Complex 1, NADH dehydrogenase, ubiquinone Q, complex 2, succinate dehydrogenase, complex 3, cytochromes, complex, uh, it also contains uh, the in between is cytochrome C, complex 4 is cytochrome A, A3, also called cytochrome oxidase. Fifth is, uh, it does not come under electron transport chain, it is coming under oxidative phosphorylation. So we call it as complex 5. So we will come to the what are the reactions that occurs in the electron transport chain. So what happens we are getting NADH and no? the acetyl CoA becomes uh, gives hydrogen to the um, NADH, NAD, so NAD becomes NADH2. See NADH2, it is more electronegative, it is more electronegative, it is more electronegative in complex 1, you have to understand this concept, complex, then only it can donate the electron. So what happens here, uh, it donates 2 hydrogen, hmm? it donates 2 hydrogen, 2 hydrogen contains 2 protons and 2 electrons. So these protons 2H plus will be liberated in the medium. 
this two electrons it enters into this complex one it is called NADH CoQ reductase uh, so this uh, two electrons uh, uh, they will they goes to the FMN complexes flavoprotein complexes and they contain iron sulfur complexes so they transfer the electrons so what happens and here uh, these uh, FM and ion sulfur complexes they are arranged in more electronegative and uh, to the more electropositive redox potential. So, what happens? Energy will be liberated. So, this energy uh, is used to pump protons. This energy is used to pump protons from the uh, matrix to the intermitochondrial space. See, see which protons are pumped? The protons from NADH2 is not pumped. You have to remember that. The protons, there will be separate protons in the uh, mitochondrial matrix. They are pumped. Huh? Okay, what is this complex 2? Complex 2, uh, it is less uh, electronegative uh, than complex 1. So, uh, FADH uh, donates, FADH2 donates this 2H plus and 2 electrons to complex 2. They also have FM and ion sulfur complexes. So, these uh, electrons from complex 1 and complex 2, they enter into coenzyme Q. So, you can see this is complex 1. Complex 1 accepts the hydrogen from NADH uh, and these electrons are transferred via the ion sulfur complexes and the flavin mononucleotide to coenzyme Q. Uh, and uh, what is complex 2? Complex 2 is succinate dehydrogenase. It will accept FADH2 and uh, transfers this hydrogen and electrons to coenzyme Q. So, what is this coenzyme Q? It is a quinone derivative like a vitamin K. We also call it as vitamin Q. So, it accepts uh, two protons and two electrons from complex 1 and 2. It transfers it to complex 3. So, what does complex 3 do? Uh, it, uh, it is also called CoQ cytochrome C reductase. It receives from coenzyme Q. It has cytochrome B and cytochrome C1. Uh, this all this cytochromes have four fire entering with ion in its center. So ion will interchange from ferric form to ferrous form. After accepting this uh, electron, it becomes ferric to ferrous. After uh, after the, um, this electron attaches to complex three, it goes to complex uh, four. So in this mean process, since electron are jumping inside the complex three, uh, it uh, the energy is liberated, and this energy is used to pump some protons. <laughs> so cytochrome C accepts the two electrons, and cytochrome C donates the two electrons to complex four. Complex four is made up of cytochrome A and A three, and uh, this is a special type of enzyme. It is a oxidase. So the oxygen we breathe what is the purpose of breathing we take oxygen uh, because only for this process for cytochrome oxidase this oxygen combines with the 2 H plus that is in the medium and the two electrons that is in the complex 4 so H2O is made this is also energy liberating process so in complex 4 also two protons are pumped so the overall reaction is two proton plus O plus two electron becomes H2O so this is a overall reaction complex 1 donates it absorbs H2 H plus and 2 electrons from NADH2 it donates to coenzyme Q and uh, complex 2 also accepts from uh, in FADH2 and donates to complex Q Q donates it to complex 3 complex 3 donates to, uh, to com cytochrome C from cytochrome C it is donated to complex 4 complex 4 accepts the molecular oxygen and it converts uh, to H plus plus electrons plus oxygen to become water. So, when two atoms of hydrogen join the oxygen atom, it forms H2O plus energy is liberated. So, how this energy is liberated? We have seen that complex 1, complex 3 and complex 4, uh, they liberate energy. Why energy is liberated? Because electrons are transported from 
मोर एलेक्ट्रो नेगेटिव रेडॉक्स पोटेंशियल टू मोर एलेक्ट्रो पॉजिटिव रेडॉक्स पोटेंशियल द एनर्जी आर लिबरेटेड सो हाउ दिस एनर्जी इज यूज्ड टू प्रोड्यूस एटीपी सो द ट्रांसफर ऑफ इलेक्ट्रॉन्स फ्रॉम वन कंपोनेंट टू अनदर प्रोसेस रिलीज ऑफ एनर्जी सो हियर दिस कॉम्प्लेक्स 1 3 एंड 4 दे फंक्शन एज proton pump the function as proton pump see this mitochondrial membrane inner mitochondrial membrane is not freely permeable to protons the only thing that is freely permeable are gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide h plus see h plus it's a um, it's a chemical so it cannot be it's a ion it cannot be allowed inside otherwise the uh, otherwise the uh, electrochemical gradient will be affected so hydrogen can be transported only using certain proteins called transporters so complex 1 see here electrons are jumping so complex 1 energy is there this energy is used to pump uh, uh, h plus from matrix to the intermitochondrial space in complex 3 also uh, protons are pumped from matrix to the intermitochondrial space similarly in complex 4 so complex 1 pumps 4 protons complex 3 pumps 4 protons complex 2 pumps 4 protons so when nadh2 is the uh, energy source how many protons are pumped 4 plus 4 plus 2 equal to 10 protons are pumped into the intermitochondrial space when fadh2 is used fadh2 liberates the, this hydrogen to the complex 2 complex 2 does not pump any proton so complex 3 and 4 4 plus 2 equal to 6 so fadh2 pumps 6 protons you can see uh, complex 1 pumps 4 protons complex 3 pumps 4 protons and complex 4 pumps 2 protons so what you can see here uh, you can see so much of protons are pumped in the intermitochondrial space so a gradient is being created uh, if lot of people are entering into the bus what happens there will be so much of rush inside the bus so the people want to get out and so in an electrochemical gradient see why there is a electrochemical gradient electrical because it's a h plus more positive ions so that means more positivity outside means more negativity inside so electrical gradient and chemical gradient hydrogen hydrogen more concentration is accumulating in the intermitochondrial space so they want to come back inside they want to come back inside so how are you going to uh, allow this hydrogen to come inside by complex 5 there is another complex called complex 5 using that is called atp synthase before that there are some specific inhibitors are that said exam question you read all these things can see sex, uh, succinic dehydrogenase monoamine is a competitive inhibitor carboxyl and pyrrolidine amobarbital rutinone british anti leucocyte anti mycin hydrogen sulfide cyanide carbon monoxide so these are the poisons to this electron transport chain so welcome to oxidative phosphorylation this is part 2 of this lecture so coupling of oxidation with phosphorylation is not a known as oxidative phosphorylation that is removal of hydrogen and mixing of oxygen this is called oxidation and the, during this process energy should be liberated by creating atp from adp plus phosphate so this is called phosphorylation so coupling both oxidation and phosphorylation is called oxidative phosphorylation this is the theory is for by dr peter mitchell in 1961 so as i told you complex 1 3 and 4 are pumping protons so there will be a electrochemical gradient so this uh, because of this electrochemical gradient this hydrogen wants to come back but this inner uh, inner mitochondrial membrane is not freely permeable to protons as we have to do in transporter so there is another complex called complex 5 so this is the uh, transporter which allows uh, this protons in the inner mitochondrial space to enter into the uh, mitochondrial matrix so we cannot uh, simply allow them huh? <laughs> see you are in a medical college for that there is a certain fees is there you know, all these things similarly to allow this hydrogen to come inside uh, the energy should be produced during this process adp should become atp 
so it's called the world's smallest molecular motor it contains two subunits f0 and f1 it has a dual c subunits and three alpha and three beta subunits and also a gamma subunit which functions as an axle see this is the inner mitochondrial membrane and this yellow color are the c subunits dual c subunits arranged like a spokes of a wheel okay so this is the gamma subunit it functions like an axle and it is immersed in the alpha beta 3 alpha and 3 beta uh, and this is called the f0 unit and this is called f1 unit what happens uh, we have seen that fadh2 pumps 10 protons and nadh pumps 10 protons via 1 3 and 4 and fadh pumps 6 protons by 3 and 4 so what happens these protons are trying to come back inside via atp synthase so what happens here is huh? so these protons there are 12 c subunits okay this in this 12 c subunits 12 protons will come and attach uh, this 12 protons will come and attach so that what happens uh, it becomes one 360 degree complete rotation during this rotation all these protons will come inside so what happens you see here and the 12 c subunits they are rotating along with the gamma axis so this gamma axis is rotating but where is the gamma axis rotating inside the alpha beta subunit alpha beta alpha beta like that inside the alpha beta subunit so you can see like a grinder it is rotating but is the other alpha and beta are rotating they are not rotating so what happens here strain is created yeah energy a yeah? strain is created what happens you keep on <laughs> ATP, ADP and phosphate so crush it down so that ATP will be released so 12 protons one complete rotation uh, so you can make one 360 degree rotation using that you can take 3 ADP and 3 phosphate and make it into 3 ATP so one complete rotation using 12 protons produces 3 ATP molecules this is a very nice video made by Harvard University as you can see here this is a eukaryotic cell and uh, it contains various organelles and there is a main important structure called mitochondria so it has the outer mitochondrial membrane the inner mitochondrial membrane the inter mitochondrial space and the matrix inside so the inter mitochondrial membrane is folded into to stay to increase the surface area so this is how a inner mitochondrial membrane looks like and you can see there are four layers in inter mitochondrial membrane two hydrophilic and two hydrophobic layers the mitochondrial membrane is constructed such that the it won't allow the protons inside or outside it is not freely permeable see gases like oxygen carbon dioxide they can diffuse freely but protons are not allowed you can see in outer uh, inter mitochondrial space there are more protons and in matrix there are less protons so there will be electrochemical gradient so inside it will be negatively charged outside it will be more positively charged so these protons are getting pumped into the mitochondrial matrix via a specialized motor called atp synthase so you can see the rotatory uh, part that is c subunit there will be 12 c subunit and uh, uh, it will be uh, attaching these protons from the outside and you can see it is uh, rotating to the anti-clockwise direction and it is making the protons go inside so during this rotation what happens when 12 protons are attached and it goes in there one complete rotation occurs so due to this complete rotation you can see the alpha and beta subunit uh, that is white and red they are not moving but the C subunits are moving uh, so uh, during this process ADP and phosphate will enter into this alpha and beta so you can see the small green color structures and white color structures that is ADP plus phosphate attaches that due to the strain created by the C subunit so that they will become ATP so this is the left side you can see the electron transport chain component complex of 1, 2, 3 and 4 
see complex 1 3 and 4 they are themselves hydrogen transporters they can pump protons from the matrix into the inter mitochondrial space during the time of electron transport chain 2 does not pump any protons uh, but from 2 uh, pro, uh, these electrons and protons will be transported to 3 and 4 so that they may pump protons so let's see about complex 1 so what is complex 1 contain in complex 1 they obtain 2 electrons and 2 protons from NADH2 ok NADH2 uh, so uh, NADH2 becomes NAD plus plus 2H plus 2H plus is nothing plus protons plus 2 electrons so these uh, protons uh, they will be liberated in the medium and these electrons uh, they will uh, pass from a negative redox potential to more electropositive redox potential you can see NADH dropping two electrons into the uh, redox centers uh, inside the complex of one so what happens they move from more electronegative to electropositive uh, redox centers in the during this process what happens the energy will be liberated The electron don't bypasses the centers, it goes like a stepwise fashion from more electropositive to electronegative redox potential. So during this jumping process, what happens? The energy will be liberated. So this energy is used to pump protons. You can see these yellow colored protons are uh, coming from top to bottom. So this energy is used to pump protons to the intermitochondrial space. So how much proton complex one pumps? Complex one pumps four protons. So from NADH2, uh, this uh, when the electrons are transported through complex one, four protons are pumped into the intermitochondrial space. And from complex 1, it is the electrons are donated to coenzyme Q, also for ubiquinone Q. It will transport these electrons to complex 3. Similarly, complex 2, see complex 2 has a less uh, redox potential than complex 1. So, um, FADH2 cannot attach to complex 1. It will come to complex 2 and it will donate electrons. These electrons will be carried out, carried by from uh, this ubiquinone Q, but no protons are pumped here. So ubiquinone Q carries this uh, electrons to your complex 3. So electron transport chain, NADH2 complex 1, 3 and 4 or FADH2 to complex 2, 3 and 4. So in complex 3, see the same thing happens when the electron comes from yeah, more electropositive, uh, more electronegative to electronegative uh, uh, atoms. What happens? The energy is liberated, and this energy is used to pump two protons. And these electrons are carried by cytochrome C to complex number four. Complex four is very very complex. It's called cytochrome oxidase enzyme. So here uh, we are breathing oxygen. So this oxygen comes here. And the cytochrome complex now it is having two electrons, okay, two electrons, and from the surrounding medium it takes up two protons. So two protons plus two electrons become two H atoms. So two H atoms from the respiratory oxygen becomes H2O. So in this meantime, here also this uh, jumping of electron occurs so that four two protons are pumped outside. Complex 4 pumps 2 protons into the inter mitochondrial space. Complex 3 uh, almost uh, 4 protons and complex 1 around 4 protons. So for a molecule of NADH2, 4 plus 4 plus 2, 10 protons are pumped into the inter mitochondrial space, which will come back inside via the ATP synthase motor producing ATP. So 12 
protons are needed to produce free ATP. Thank you. This is a favorite university question nowadays. This is also about the binding change mechanism. See, you know that three alpha and three beta subunits are there. Forget about alpha subunits. Hmm? So, at the zero degree rotation, what happens? Uh, ADP and phosphate will enter into one subunit. You concentrate on beta 2 subunit. So, yeah, 120 degree rotation, one third of the rotation, what happens? ADP plus phosphate becomes ATP. And then third rotation, it becomes O configuration. See, you can see uh, L configuration, T configuration, and O configuration. O is open. That means ATP is released. So, this happens only in beta 2 subunits. So, how many subunits are there? Beta 1, beta 2, beta 3. So, when it goes like a cycle, each 120 degree rotation can produce one ATP molecule. You can see it in the next figure. So, here you see beta 2 ATP plus phosphate. Uh, next one ATP formation, next ATP released. You can see in the middle figure, in the middle figure, you can see beta. 3. Here now ATP plus phosphate is there. Here ATP formation is there. After the rotation, ATP is released. You can see here at this time ATP plus phosphate is in beta 1. It becomes ATP formation, ATP release. This is called a binding change mechanism. So, this is Dr. Peter Michel. Ah, this is called a um, very interesting verb. It's called a yeah. Bar-tailed God beetle. I am always fascinated about this bird because it lives in Australia. Okay, Australia is in the southern hemisphere, almost near uh, the uh, Arctic Circle, Antarctica. So, uh, uh, what happens every summer? Uh, it goes to Alaska. Okay, every summer it goes to Alaska, and every winter it comes back. And the distance is 11,500 kilometers. How much? 11,500 kilometers. So, what we will do when we travel 11,500 kilometers via car or via flight? Can we go 11,500 kilometers from Chennai to Delhi? It takes around 2 hours, almost 2,500 kilometers. That itself we are becoming tired. Instead, simply sitting inside a flight. 11,500 kilometers means it will take around 7 8 hours. Flight will be intermediate. Uh, no, not, uh, almost 2 to 3 days it will take for us to go. Okay, because from here to America it takes around 12 hours. But this bird without taking drinking water and without taking any food non-stop it flies 11,500 kilometers to and fro <laughs> it goes there spends some 2 or 3 months comes back uh, per day it uses around 9.6% of its body weight to produce energy so uh, our body our biological this uh, evolution is uh, highly effective uh, no car or no no man-made vehicles can match uh, yeah, animal or a human's efficiency uh, to produce energy from the foodstuffs. So this is a potent garment for its extreme efficiency in producing energy from the foodstuff. Uh, how much it can eat? It can take uh, one, for example some 50 grams of fish uh, that is a uh, stomach will be full but using that it is flying 11,500 kilometers. Okay. So, this is because of this molecular motor. So, what are the inhibitors? You can see atrazinoside, oligomycin are the main uh, inhibitors. Ionophores. Uh, ionophores is see, uh, membrane permeability is very important. Uh, this in, inner mitochondrial membrane should, should not be permeable to H+. If it is freely permeable to H+, it won't come by ATP synthase. So, uh, it should be impermeable. Only transporters can allow this H plus ions. But what is this ionophore? Ionophores are certain substances uh, which can increase the permeability of certain ions. For example, balinomycin, they allow potassium. Gramycin is an antibiotic. It is a channel former. There is a, some uncouplers. What is this uncouplers? Oxidation and phosphorylation should be coupled. 
okay oxidation and phosphorylation should be coupled otherwise energy will not be liberated for example uh, oxidation is going on you are breaking up the food stuff so much of food stuff you are breaking down into NADH2 now this NADH2 is accumulating but phosphorylation is not happening so NADH2 is becoming H2 but this energy is not utilized to produce ATP that means energy will be wasted this is uh, what happens when you uncouple oxidation and the phosphorylation. There are uh, chemical uncouplers like 2,4-dinitrophenol used in experiments, 2,4-dinitroprosol and physiological uncouplers. So, you have to burn food, you have to burn food, but energy should not, ATP should not be produced. Can you tell me a few instances? The only instance which I can think of is heat production. Okay. We have to maintain, so which is the maximum uh, energy utilization in our body, which process uh, for BMR, maintenance of BMR. So, this heat production, uh, they utilizes a lot of energy. Um, uh, so, you have to uncouple, uh, no ATP is needed, but energy should be liberated as heat. So, here we have a physiological uncoupler, that protein is called thermogenin and another, protein, another uh, hormone called thyroxine so thyroid hormone produces heat so it uncouples oxidation from phosphorylation oxidation will be keep on when foodstuffs will burn but energy is not liberated as ATP but as heat thermogenin is present in the brown adipose tissue so these are some inhibitors already we have seen and uncoupling huh? see the top 1, 3, 4, uh, you can see this 1, 3 and 4, all these are electron transport chain and complex 5 is uh, for oxidative phosphorylation. So, uncoupling of ATC and oxphos, uh, it is done by uncouplers. So, brown adipose tissue, have you ever thought why it is brown in color? Adipose tissue should be white in color because it store fat, fat is white in color. But why brown adipose tissue is brown in color? Because it contains lot of mitochondria, mitochondria is brown in color. Hmm? Uh, why does it contain lot of mitochondria to produce energy? No, to, for uncoupling, to produce a lot of heat. So, brown adipose tissue is the area where heat is produced. Uh, how do you do that? Keep on going on with the electron transport chain, but inhibit oxidative phosphorylation, you inhibit phosphorylation. So, energy will be liberated as heat. Uh, this is done by protein called thermogen. Thermogen increases the permeability of hydrogen ion. So, what happens? This hydrogen ion cannot come by ATP synthesis. It will easily enter into the inter uh, uh, mitochondrial space via the inner mitochondrial membrane. So, ATP synthesis becomes useless. So, some of the inner mitochondrial membrane transporter are there. Uh, oxygen, carbon dioxide, they can easily go inside and outside. And fatty acid, fatty acid, see, uh, fatty acid synthesis occurs in the cytosol. But to burn it, uh, fatty acid oxygen it should be occurring in the mitochondria. So, fatty acid is very huge. So, how do you transport that? There is called an acyl carnitine transporter. Pyruvate H plus is important. Pyruvate is inside. It should come inside to become acetyl coa. So, pyruvate H plus imported is there. You can see oxygen, ammonia can easily go inside and outside. Ketone bodies, carbon dioxide. Fatty acid goes via acyl carnitine transporter. Hydrogen pyruvate symporter is there. So, H2PO4 is transported inside in exchange for OH minus via an antiporter. And uh, this is replaced to transport di and tricarboxylic acid in mitochondria using malate uh, phosphate antiporter where malate enters inside. Malate is used to transport citrate. Uh, citrate is produced from fatty acid catabolism for TCA cycle by malate citrate antiporter. See, these are of theoretical value. Alpha ketoglutarate. Uh, alpha ketoglutarate from amino acids during starvation enters into mitochondria by malate alpha ketoglutarate antiporter. You can see all these things. So, OH H2PO4 antiport, HPO4 malate antiport, malate citrate, malate alpha ketoglutarate antiport. Uh, and ADP is constantly needed inside. See, uh, oxidative phosphorylation is to occur. 
ADP should combine with phosphate to become ATP. So this ATP should not accumulate and ADP should not be deficient. So ADP will go inside and ATP should uh, come outside. This is called ATP 4 minus ADP 3 minus antiporter. NaH plus antiporter, calcium hydrogen antiporter, hydrogen uh, phosphate symporter is there. Mm, and there is a energy linked dehydrogenase is there. Uh, so NADPH, uh, usually NADPH is not used for energy, but if NADPH is needed to be used for energy, it donates hydrogen to NADH. Uh, so this uh, this is how uh, energy linked dehydrogenase works. So ATP, ADP transporter, all these other transporters are here. Uh, so how NADH from glycolysis, glycolysis occurs in the cytosol. How it enters into the mitochondria by two shuttles, one is called glycerophosphate shuttle and another is a malate aspartate shuttle. So this is the glycerophosphate shuttle. You can see uh, dihydroxyacetone phosphate becomes glycerol 3 phosphate uh, by uh, utilizing NADH. Okay, by utilizing NADH. Glycerol 3 phosphate is permeable inside mitochondria. It here it becomes dihydroxyacetone phosphate but it uses F8. So the hydrogen uh, uh, attaches here to F8. So there will be obvious energy loss. See NADH produces uh, uh, pumps 10 protons. So it produces around uh, 2.5 ATPs. But FAD produces only 1.5 ATPs using 6 protons. So when this shuttle, glycerophosphate shuttle is used, you lose 1 ATP. And malate aspartate shuttle. This does not use, uh, this does not lose any energy. You can see uh, oxaloacetate becomes malate. Uh, so here uh, NADH uh, the, the hydrogen is taken up inside malate. This malate enters inside and hydrogen is liberated to become NADH. So NADH is produced inside the mitochondria. Hmm. So what happens to the oxaloacetate? Oxaloacetate using SGOT, it becomes alpha ketoglutarate and aspartate. Alpha ketoglutarate goes outside in exchange for malate. Now what happens to aspartate? Aspartate goes inside hmm, and becomes again glutamate and oxaloacetate. Glutamate is coming inside against aspartate antiport. So we will come to the final part of the here. Mitochondria, see lot of processes occurring in the mitochondria. One is this urea cycle, fatty acid catabolism, TCA cycle and electron transport chain, oxidative phosphorylation. So mitochondria is like a brain to the human body. It's the most important uh, organelle in the human body. So, uh, it does not, uh, it should have a separate headquarters, okay. It should not trust the nucleus uh, for any purpose. So, mitochondria, it has its own DNA, it has its own ribosome, it produces its own proteins. This DNA will be derived from the mother. Uh, so, if those DNA, some problem is there, what happens? Hmm? Fatal infantile, mitochondrial myopathy and renal dysfunction. This is one problem. Melas, mitochondrial encephalopathy, lactic acidosis, and stroke. Here, complex 1 or complex 3 is deficient. Uh, they are thought to be involved in Alzheimer's and diabetes mellitus also. Uh, many drugs and poisons inhibit mitochondria, and mitochondrial errors are there, like uh, Leber's optic, hereditary optic neuropathy, and mitochondrial myopathy. And uh, mitochondria is another important function is apoptosis. Uh, 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 apoptosis is programmed cell death. So what happens? First step of apoptosis, apoptosis is uh, uh, mitochondrial membrane damage. Uh, so what happens? Cytochrome will leak inside the cytosol. That is the first uh, thing in the programmed cell death. So this is uh, electron transport chain. I think you have enjoyed and understood this class. So the basic points is we eat carbohydrates, proteins, fat. It become glucose, fatty acid, and this uh, amino acid all becomes acetyl CoA. Okay, all becomes acetyl CoA from acetyl CoA. Hydrogen is removed. So removal of hydrogen is called oxidation. 
This hydrogen is removed to become NADH2 and FADH2. Now take this NADH2 and FADH2 inside mitochondria. You remove that hydrogen H2. H2 becomes 2 H plus plus 2 E minus. So this electrons they jump from more electron negative to more electro positive redox potential. Complex 1, 3 and 4 and FADH2 donates to complex 2, 3 and 4. So this 1, 3 and 4 what they do? They pumps proton you know, from the matrix to the intermitochondrial space. NADH2 pumps 10 protons, FADH2 pumps 6 protons. These protons want to come back inside. This is called oxidative phosphorylation. So it comes via a complex number 5. ATP synthase. While coming here, what happens? ADP combines with phosphate form ATP. So this is the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. So 12 protons is needed to produce 3 ATP. So NADH2 produces 2.5 ATP. FADH2 produces 1.5 ATP. Uh, I will meet you in the next class. I also enjoyed this class very much. Thank you.